and then she went to the next shop to tell those people. So I don't know if that's going to happen. It happened in the Bay Area today, so we'll see. Well, um, let anyone in the audience who uh, who is uh, more unaware of, of your exploits and everything with Super Mega, uh, yeah, let, let them know who you are and, and everything, because I, I feel like you and I are, are fans of each other and like each other, but we don't necessarily have audiences that might have the most natural crossover, because a lot of my fans just kind of yeah. tend to mostly just know and be aware of what's going on in the music world. Cool, yeah. Um, I have a YouTube channel <laughs> with my, my good boy, Ryan McGee, called Super Mega where we upload like every day, or we tr try to upload every day. Um, we do like a, a weekly podcast and we just upload a bunch of random shit to our channel. Um, a lot of gaming stuff, if you're into that, a lot of like live action stuff, a couple shows that we produce. Uh, and then we just bounce around to a bunch of other people's channels a lot too. So essentially that's, that's, that's the gist of, of what we do, yeah. Creative boys. Yeah, yeah, just kind of cooking stuff up. <laughs> Well, Matt, Matt is Matt is a funny guy. He's an entertaining guy. He's a likable guy. Cute to boot. Um, but I, I, I've, I've had you on uh, today because last night I was on your Twitter and I saw I saw you talking that shit. I was talking some shit. Yeah, I saw I saw you talking that talk on Twitter last night. Uh, what was, was, what was, was, was that? Was that yeah. What was what was that talk you were talking last night? I was watching the uh, I was watching the debate between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders, and I, I was getting a little fired up. Getting fired up off that. Yeah, because I'm a I'm a massive Joe Biden supporter. Um, yeah. I, I, I would go all out for Joe Biden. It's it's ride or die with Biden for me. That's a joke. No, um, I absolutely am like a huge Bernie supporter. Uh, I can't stand Joe Biden, and I was just watching the debate. And then afterwards, I was watching the analysis and watching how it was being spun. Uh, and I was getting a little worked up, you know? So did you watch the debate? I, the, the headache had me totally fucking just out last night. I would have made However, it. however it, I, I kind of, I saw most of the clips post-debate, and I kind of knew how it was going to play out. You know, I mean, um, Biden was going to just, like, lie about his record a number of times. Right. Bernie was going to... It, it, you know, at, while I agree with Bernie's policies, and, which is why I obviously support the guy, um, you know, tomorrow if we woke up and Joe Biden and Bernie Friday had, uh, if, if Bernie had a freaky Friday moment and they just switch platforms, like totally, um, I mean, it would just be like, fuck Bernie all day. And I'd be yeah. totally in for Joe. But, yeah, uh, absolutely. but that's, that's not the case. But, uh, you know, still having said that, um, support the guy's policies but you know i i feel like he he just plays a little too nice a lot of the time and he right. he, he lets yeah. joe just kind of like smirk through like hey you got nine super packs and it's, okay name them <laughs> yeah okay yeah not yeah gonna, i not gonna do that i i i think that's that's definitely an issue because it bernie definitely is I, I guess a little too nice and i think the current state of uh politics where we are i think that it's I think you have to get a little dirtier in the sense of in a debate, you really got to like, you know, like really keep going uh, when you when you can call someone's bluff. And I think Bernie did a really good job calling Biden's bluff, especially on the Social Security thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I wish he had furthered the, the super PAC comment when when Joe brought up the nine super PACs shit. And then Bernie was like, what are you talking about? I don't have any super PACs. And Biden said, oh, you want me to name them? And Bernie was like, yeah, go ahead, name them. And then Biden's response was like, oh, give me a break. I wish that that had gone further. Because a lot of people that watch at home um, that are – a lot of people that watch are very uninformed and don't – they're not going to do any research beyond what they see in the debate. So for, for someone to lie in a debate, like for Joe Biden to say, like, oh, you have nine super PACs, even though it's not true, a lot of people that watch that – will think that's true because they heard it come from Joe Biden in the debate and they're not going to go do more research. So I wish that there had been more like prodding on that end to kind of disprove that right off the bat. But, you know, what can you do? You know, let's let's drift away from sort of the direct kind of electoral implications of, of all of this, because, you know, let, let's let's face it. I mean, fingers crossed that, um, you know, Bernie is able to kind of carry this thing to the convention, gets close to 
some kind of plurality. Maybe there's an upset. But I mean, while I still support him, I, you know, support and agree with much of what he was saying during the debate. And, you know, if, if you're informed and you are aware of sort of the all the tape of Biden, just like saying the exact opposite of everything he was saying last night or any policy he pretends to support now. Yeah. Um, you you kind of know what's up. But I mean, in a way, um, the, the writing for the campaign, I think, is kind of on the wall. And the question is, if we do find ourselves in a place where Bernie, you know, does lose and we have to run Biden and Biden wins or Trump, uh, you know, wins, what we're going to be faced with is the question of, you know, at the end of the day, these policies are ultimately what is the most important thing, not so much the candidate that supports yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and how do we implement them from there? And what are those policies? Because once Bernie is gone, how are we going to recall and remember, like, what is important and what's significant? And I feel like for you and me as content creators, uh, you know, kind of a key thing that a lot of people don't notice or talk about or, you know, really understand is uh, is, is kind of the healthcare situation. Because, oh, absolutely, you know, yeah. There are a lot of people who sort of see what you and I do and anybody who is, uh, you know, in YouTube and Twitch and even in music as well, because what a lot of people might not necessarily be aware of. And this was a small point of discussion in the recent interview I had with Jamie and Code Orange, uh, you know, your favorite bands who are signed to, you know, maybe even Roadrunner or Sub Pop, Matador and, and even fairly larger labels as well. Uh, they're coming through with maybe a fat, you know, label advance or something like that, but they don't have health care. Like they don't have health. Right, right. And, you know, you have to understand like the lifestyle that they're in the midst of. And I'm not just talking about like partying and drinking and drugging or anything like that. Meeting a lot of people. If you're like on the road going on tour and stuff. Meeting a lot of people, not getting the most rest, not on the best diet. Um, you know, touring is a pretty physically grueling thing, you know, for the short amounts of time that personally I've done it, uh, you know, and, and yeah. I'm not going on, I'm not going on stage and I'm fucking hammering on, you know, instruments or whatever. Uh, it's, it's a pretty physically taxing thing. And, uh, you no, know, absolutely. And there are a lot of musicians who I've known over the years who either have to quit or put things on hiatus because they have a medical bill they have to pay for, or, uh, you know, the, the whole tragic situation that went on with, uh, Phil Elverham and the, the passing of his wife a little while back who, uh, you know, if it wasn't for a, I, I believe he had said publicly, if it wasn't for the money that was raised through, uh, you know, places like GoFundMe or the, whatever comparable website it was that he raised money on, um, you know, he would have been up to his ears and like, tens or maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical debt uh, because yeah. of that cancer diagnosis and everything. So, you know, it, it's, it's insane that, you know, all of our favorite musicians and content creators across the internet, no matter what stripe they are, um, you know, th at the end of the day, they're faced with not having health insurance, not having health care. And uh, uh, again, some of y'all might think because we get all these views, like we're balling, but uh, <laughs> some of us are trying to spend that money on just like, the bare necessities that we would maybe be given if we had a salary job at a corporation or whatever. And, um, you know, I, I feel like the answer to this is, is only something like a Medicare for all system, something like what you would get if you were in Canada, well, yeah. like, kind of like any first world country. And, you know, it would seem kind of like just, I don't know, just just seem like basic common sense to to have such a thing because uh, under such a system the government can and does in other countries negotiates for things like uh, medications for um, you know also uh, procedures to be done uh, make sure that you know, the facilities that are offering them actually can continue to run uh, efficiently and, and run in the black uh, whereas over here we're just getting mercilessly price gouged on everything you know millions of americans are rationing insulin i would be afraid honestly that it'd be to be a content creator with with something like diabetes yeah uh, because of you know just the insanity if if you have a bad month i mean you know you're on youtube you know that a january month is a bad adsense month no matter how many views you fucking get because oh, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's when the ads just drop out of nowhere and who knows as a result of you know this whole like economic downturn as a result of the coronavirus thing how much advertising dollars are going to be cut from platforms like youtube uh, so even if you're you know getting like millions of views on a video the money you have coming in could just be like total shit and if you yeah. run into a health situation um, you know, if you catch the virus and <laughs> you do happen to end up on a ventilator or something like that, you know, not only are you uh, without insurance, but you're also because you're sick, you're not able to have that continual income to either pay for health insurance or pay for the procedures to kind of help you through whatever you're dealing with. Yeah, I think I think what's the most messed up about it is that we are the only 
um, advanced nation, uh, what is it? I, I think 31 out of the 32 or 32 out of the 33, uh, like most advanced nations on earth have some form of health care where it's guaranteed as a right, where in America, it, it depends on like, oh, do you, do you have a job? Can, like are, you're able to basically only get health care if you have a job or you have to go through some other third party health care company, which is still going to gouge the prices for you. And um, I, I think What's fucked is that, let's say my mom were to get cancer tomorrow. Uh, my mom does not make a lot of money. My mom has not a lot of money at all. Um, she's a single woman. And then for her to get, get some horrible like lung cancer diagnosis, and all of a sudden she's running up a bill of three, dollars $400,000, it's like there's two options. It's either uh, you know fight the cancer and then go into extreme uh, poverty uh, and extreme debt while also still possibly not surviving from cancer or uh, just accepting defeat and then dying from cancer. So I, I think that personally, I think a government should provide health care for people as a right, because I think a government's job should be to take care of its people. And a government wants its people to be the best it can be so that the nation can be the best that it can be. Um, and, and I just think it's so fucked that we, we, we have a system that's so dominated by capitalism that even things like insulin, things that people need to survive, and no one chooses to have a disease. No one is just like, oh, I'm going to have diabetes. It's like if you get diabetes, you're dealt a shit hand, and you have to do everything you can to live with that. And if you have a system that's bringing in billions and billions a year that's telling you like, oh, you know, you need this basic necessity to live. Well, it's going to cost you thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars where every other modern country, you know, you would get that as part of your uh, guaranteed health care. Yeah. yeah and, and, and let's talk about what generates those billions of dollars a year, because, look, I mean, I understand that in this country we value things just as I do naturally, uh, people who are entrepreneurial people who, uh, you know, who know how to uh, uh, engage in free enterprise, as it were. Uh, at the end of the day, like, you know, nobody looks at someone like LeBron James, for example, and begrudges him the millions and millions of dollars that he's made off of basketball. Like, people see that guy, they like that guy, they think he's talented, they think he's a good dude. Like, nobody sees that man and thinks he shouldn't have his money He's an asshole. He earned that money unfairly, this, that, and the other thing. Uh, you know, he has adoring fans who love him and love what he does and support him in what he does and, and think he's where he is because he is unequivocally, like, one of the best at it, period. You know, point yeah. four. Um, you know, he's in the position that he's in because he's just supremely talented, and, and, that's, and that's just what it is. Uh, but when you're talking about um, the incredible profits of what you're seeing in something like the healthcare industry, I mean, that money is being generated as a result of a market failure that is specific to that industry. You know, uh, insulin or any kind of necessary medical procedure. It's not like the tickets to the basketball game. It's not like uh, maybe a certain brand of bread that you see on the aisle that you could go without and maybe buy something else if you wanted to eat that was cheaper. It's not like uh, those new Nikes that you've been eyeing or whatever at Foot Locker. It's something that you either are going to pay for because you want to live or you go without and die. And people will pay anything to live. People will empty their bank accounts to live. People will go into hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of debt just to live. Yeah, like, that's that's not like a product or service that you could compare to any other product or service because the choice that you're giving people is life or death. It's, yeah, yeah, that's, it's that's not really your most basic this... human instinct is to survive. So people yeah. want to survive no matter what. And then when there's a system that is telling you to survive, you have to do this. You have to you have to pay for this medication that's going to be ten thousand um, dollars. People are going to obviously take that option. So people are almost, uh, it's kind of like you're enslaved to this system, you know, where you really have no choice. And um, that, that's the problem is it's like, how do you really fix that? You know, it's like with, with something that has so much money and so much power, like the pharmaceutical industry and the healthcare industry, um, how do you really begin to fix that? Which is one of the biggest reasons why I support Bernie is because I, I feel like, oh, okay, here's somebody 
who's come into the picture, who's really the first person to um, just fully vocally be against this and have a track record of being against this, not a politician who's coming in and uh, suddenly saying like, oh, I support this after voting against it in the past. This is someone you can go back and look at for decades, the same record. Um, and somebody who has a fired up fan base uh, that I feel like could get these things done. Um, the problem is, you know, with current polls and stuff uh, and the recent performance with Biden, it seems like it's becoming less of an option that Bernie could win the nomination. I still think it's possible. Um, but I, I think given all the other candidates dropping out and endorsing him um, right before Super Tuesday and stuff like that, it made it a lot harder. Yeah, that, that was a that was a moderate master stroke. Uh, sort yeah. of coalescing together and just like I feel like that had to be coordinated. Completely dominating the narrative and, and understanding that most people going into or at least a great deal of people going into, uh, you know, that voting booth before an event like Super Tuesday have not really been paying attention up until that point and are now just like, okay, well, what looks good? You know, I'm, I'll turn on the news, you know, I'll see what's going on. It's like, oh, wow, like Biden looks amazing right now. You know, I'm yeah. endorsing him. Um, but, you know, the, the polls don't look good in that sense. They do look good in other senses. Uh, we're, we're just at a very strange crossroads right now because exit polling on a lot of these polls is telling us that 60% of Americans hitting the polls support something like Medicare for all. Yeah. However, if you flip that, you know, 29% of Americans going into those polls based on just their fear of Trump, their fear of coronavirus, their fear of everything kind of crumbling around them, don't really care about whether or not the candidate is aligning with their views. And they just want somebody who's going to come in and bring some sense of normalcy, I guess, which I, I get, you know, I totally understand. People are afraid. People are freaked out. And look, this is not the first time that Americans have been driven to the polls during a time when there is a crisis occurring and it has sort of like, you know, informed the narrative of, of you know, who people end up voting for, um, you know, wanting to go for more of a safe choice or what they perceive as a safe, uh, quote unquote, electable choice. Um, yeah. When that, may, when that may not, in fact, be the case, uh, you know, but the fact that we're so close to kind of flipping the script on Medicare for all in a way that just was not not there in 2016, that was not there in, uh, you know, 2012 and 2008, I, I think says a lot. You know, I mean, the sorts of things Bernie's talking about is, is really the only sort of thing that back in the day when I was first getting into politics that you might hear at like a Green Party meeting. You know, yeah. a lot of what Bernie's platform, um, you know, has been over the years has now been kind of normalized amongst a lot of the Democratic base. And, and I think that says something. You know, I, I think which, which here... Yeah, I, I think from here, what's going to matter is that, uh, you know, people our age and older are going to have to take it upon themselves to start getting involved, start organizing and just like start running for local office or something, because, you know, and, and which could even be possible if, you know, you're an AOC type who runs in a, in a uh, congressional district that you think you could dominate if either your opponent isn't really campaigning all that hard or if it's small enough. Uh, to the point where you feel like you could actually make some waves. Um, and, you know, and, and then from there, climb up the political ladder of, of, of power, as it were. But uh, I feel like from here, what it's going to take is for people to kind of just seize upon those, um, uh, those platform policies that uh, translated so well for so many people in the Bernie campaign and just be a younger, more vibrant, more exciting type of candidate who, uh, you know, maybe my biggest critique of Bernie's approach so far is, like I said earlier, you know, not being as, as willing to go to the mat with his opponents face to face as I think he could or should have. And, um, and also, you know, trying to, uh, to do better to uh, tailor your message to all kinds of voters, because I, I feel like over the course of his campaign, while I love Bernie's platform, uh, you know, I, I feel like he did have a bit of a blind spot when it came to the significance of what would be the electability argument. You know, uh, I, I feel like by the time uh, that argument became as obviously significant as it was, um, you know, he hadn't been making it along the whole time. And, you know, at the end of the day, how, how afraid people are of what's going on right now. 
Uh, everyone's just looking, well, who's electable? Who's electable? Who's electable? Well, the media is telling me this guy's electable. So I, I guess that guy. Um, you know, and, and look, there are some voters at the end of the day that aren't really all that policy savvy or don't really know or care all that much about policy. There are truly voters who all they really care about right now, sadly, is that they just want the tweets to go away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if that's what some people want, I mean, if, if I'm a Bernie type of, of candidate and I care about all of these different policy, you know, platforms, I'll throw that the fuck on top of it, too. OK, look, there will be less Twitter drama as well. So, you know, and on top of it, I'll give you health care. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I do think that, that, that in a sense, there does need to be an argument made for the political normies, you know, the types who just basically want the country to run smoothly in a way where they don't need to think about it. You know, I, right. I think you can appeal to those voters while also trying to run a grassroots campaign where you're motivating people who, you know, the types of people who are going to go door to door, the types of people who are going to make the arguments, the types of people who are going to meet people face to face and, and, uh, you know, really try to sell them onto what you're doing. Right. And I, I think that that is a part of the reason why, why Bernie doesn't get the turnout that you would expect because so many uh, so much of Bernie's uh, like dedicated fan base are younger people, and the problem is, and it's been proven time and time again, even though they're fired up, like young people don't go out and vote. And I think that's one of the biggest things that needs to change right now is that young people are not going out and voting. Young people think their vote doesn't matter. Young people stay in. And then when young people stay in, you get all of the, uh, you know, the boomers and you get all of the like older people uh, coming out because they're, you know, Older people t seem to always vote. Uh, and a lot of people, like you said, that might be in the middle or, or more uninformed voters, uh, they look at Biden, and Biden is a name they already recognize. Biden has been vice president, so it's like, oh, I can trust that. Uh, and then also, he's so much more centrist than, than Bernie, and I think a lot of the silent majority is not looking for uh, a, a, left, a, a far-left candidate, which that's the thing, is Bernie is not even far left um, because what's funny is I've talked to a lot of people from other countries and they say that like, wow, the, the fact that people in America say that Bernie's policies and Bernie's ideas are far left um, or radical is crazy because like to a lot of people in Europe, like Bernie's ideas just seem like the normal, you know, and then there's actual real far left candidates. Um, I, I think the, I think the silent majority that comes out on election days uh, I think just feels more comfortable with someone like Biden because it's a name they recognize. And then, of course, a lot of these people in the silent majority are not going to be more to the left. They're probably going to be more in the middle and stuff. So he appeals more to that demographic. I was even talking to someone recently um, that was telling me how, like, they're a huge Bernie fan. They love all of Bernie's policies, but they still <laughs> voted for Biden um, because they feel like Biden is just more in the middle and can get things done. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit of a uh, a misconception that needs to be, uh, uh, you, you know, sort of un uncovered in a way, because you, ha you have to consider the history of the fact that Biden spent so many years in the Obama administration getting nothing done because the Obama yeah. administration essentially allowed Mitch McConnell to block anything and everything that he was able to as soon as he was in the position that he was. Um, and still to this day, even as the opposite party you know, even as the opposite party is making a big deal of the whole Hunter Biden thing, which, you know, I, I disagree that that's nepotism. I don't disagree that, uh, you know, that's corruption in its own way. Um, he still thinks that, oh, yeah, you know, I can totally work with these people. Like, they obviously do not like you. <laughs> they obviously don't have anything to do with you. So, and, and also such a big problem with that is I, I think electing um, Biden as the nominee is when Biden goes up into debates against Trump, the problem is Biden already has so many um talking points that the right can use to attack him with that they've been developing over years where they don't necessarily have that with bernie you know with with biden they have this stuff with hunter biden with ukraine uh they have the iraq war that he voted for they have all of his voting records uh well, which he's, he's, vote, he's made a lot of the same bad votes that hillary did and trump can yeah. run a lot of the same plays that he did against hillary just on biden you know he could turn the rust belt against biden just like he did on hillary yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and I think maybe. the debates would focus more on those things than actual policy. And that's what matters, where I feel like if we had a debate where it's Bernie versus Trump, I think that the debate would focus a lot more on policy 
than on uh, these these different uh, you know right wing talking points and, and theories and stuff. Uh, where I feel like with Biden, the entire campaign is going to focus on that. Like with Hillary, um, you know how Fox News and and a lot of news organizations. When they talk about Hillary, there's always a different uh, controversy. There's always a different uh, conspiracy theory, stuff like that. And I think that Biden would just be a repeat of that. And they would not focus on the issues at all. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think there's a, you know, look, if there are a lot of voters out there who want normalcy and want things to run smoothly and just want things to be okay, as it were, uh, there's certainly an argument to be made for a lot of Bernie's policy platforms uh, on that issue, because what is more disruptive to the average American's live, uh, life than going bankrupt because of, a, you know, because of a medical bill? You know, what's more disruptive to the average American's life than all of these wars that we have going on overseas and, you know, sort of the, the implications that has in terms of uh, fostering more terrorism? Uh, what is more interruptive to the average American's life than um, the drug war, than uh, uh, just abject poverty going on through the country? Um, you know, again, these are all normalcy arguments. These, if we were to fix these problems, this would bring more equilibrium to society as a whole. Uh, but Biden is not going to provide, you know, solutions to these problems. He's only going to continue the status quo that brought us Trump in the first place. And what I'm concerned about is, even if Biden does get into office, do we eventually down the road get uh, someone who's worse than Trump in a way? Yeah. I mean, so, I so somebody Trump... that's worse, but also smarter and is able to do the things that Trump wants to do, but uh, is able to actually do them because they don't have such a big mouth, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And is, is actually more aware of how the government works and yeah, uh, yeah. More cunning in a way, um, you know, which is why there's a lot of legitimate fear about. Well, if Trump gets out of office, you know, what happens if it's Pence? You know, Pence actually kind of knows how all the levers of power work. And, uh, you know, and, and the effects that he's been able to have so far just as the vice president has sort of been a negative because the people he's brought into the fold that are more of the evangelical stripe are kind of a danger to the health of our democracy and, you know, the uh, sanctity of the First Amendment as well. But, you know, that's kind of another issue. So, you know, it's it's a it's definitely a scary time socially and politically. And I truly don't know what the next, you know, six months or year is going to hold in terms of like what direction the country is moving in, though. I do find it encouraging that, you know, there are more people than there were prior who are, um, you know, aware of and, and open to things like, you know, hey, everyone having health care kind of sounds like not too bad of an idea. And the internet does allow people the ability to actually see it functioning in basically every other first world country. And, yeah. uh, you know, while, uh, you know, I think there are definitely policies and ideas that we can embra be embracing that are a lot bolder and, uh, um, you know, more, uh, 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 you know, more, more left field or maybe even radical than that. Uh, what I know is that uh, the American electorate is only going to go baby steps on this shit. And, uh, you know, considering how far we were able to go so far with the ACA, as much as a, a fucking, you know, half measures that was, mm -hmm. um, this is really kind of the next necessary step, you know, at least putting ourselves in a position where there's still a healthcare market in terms of hospitals and, you know, pharmaceutical companies and this, that, and the other, but the government is the one paying the single payer, for everyone's procedures. And as the single payer is actually able to negotiate prices down in a way where uh, we're saving money uh, and, uh, and people aren't, you know, having to be price gouged for things that, again, they would pay anything for because it's life and death. You know, it's not like an elective surgery. It's not like, uh, you know, some kind of piece of supreme clothing that you could go without if you didn't, if you didn't actually have the money for it, if you didn't want it. You know, it's, it's a life or death procedure that you, uh, you know, you're, you're buying into, uh, which again, you'll pay anything for because people want yeah. to People want to survive. Yeah, and I, I, I think that it, it is baby steps for sure. And, and unfortunately, like as much as I want to believe, I don't see America embracing Medicare for all right now. Um, but I, but I think what's important is that I, I think I think that the idea has become much more popular, and it has to slowly work its way in. Um, and here's the thing is like if if Bernie loses, he's not gonna run again when he's uh what, eighty two, eighty three. Yeah, this, this is um, definitely his last run at this point. Right. So it's not for like the presidency anyway. being president in the future. 
but one way I would think about it is if he, if, if he were to, to drop out, um, I think that kind of the message that he brought into existence in American politics and the message that he brought to a wide scale uh, knowledge to, to people um, will be continued on through future people, uh, whether that's AOC, whether that's other people we don't know about yet. And I think that if America is not ready for someone like Bernie yet, he's kind of like the stepping stone that will inspire uh, the next generation to, to have another Bernie that will be successful. In, um, and that's not saying Bernie's unsuccessful. That's just in getting the nomination. Um, I think he's very successful, even if he doesn't be become president. I think he's very successful in the fact that he has fired up so many young people and people of all ages in America um, to embrace these ideas that people try to tell you are radical, but are really not radical at all. They're ideas that we can easily fund as a government, ideas that most of the rest of the world has, and ideas that will make our lives fundamentally better. Um, and a lot of people are convinced that they will not make our lives better. And there's a lot of industries working to try to convince people that those ideas will not make our lives better. So I think that Bernie overall, even if he does not get the nomination, um, will be remembered almost as like a grandfather of a movement that, um, will like only grow from this point on, even if Biden becomes president, even if Trump wins again, I don't think this movement is gonna go anywhere. And I think it can only grow from here, especially as uh, younger people enter politics more and uh, the current generation that we have in power is going to eventually fade away. Yeah, I agree with everything you said there. And this message is for anybody who, you know, might be considering running or doing anything in politics and potentially trying to you know, make these sort of moves themselves. I, I think if you're going to go forward and try to make any impact in politics in terms of achieving the sort of ideas that Bernie has put out there and the left is putting out there right now, um, look, it's, it's only going to happen one of, one of two ways. Um, you know, you're either such a magnetic Barack Obama type of politician, amazing rhetorician, super charismatic, who, if you remember at the time, uh, Barack was not necessarily the first choice of the establishment at the time when he was primarying Hillary. Um, you know, the media was definitely more in for Hillary, and uh, th those two really went to war. And uh, it was, you know, it was much uglier than Bernie's been willing to be against Biden or any other candidate that he's been running against in this cycle. You know, I mean, Hillary's campaign went as far as to drop that picture of him wearing, you know, that, that turban and, you know, sort of like insinuating the whole Muslim thing, which a lot of Americans were sort of uh, skeptical of in the first place. You know, Wait, did her campaign was, drop that? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that. Oh, I didn't know that. From the well, Hillary campaign. It was very, it was a very, wow. it was a very behind the scenes sort of thing. And anybody who is affiliated with the campaign now sort of washes their hands of it because yeah. um, Barack is in the position that he's in, you know. Um, but that was very much like, you know, some, a dirty trick from the Hillary campaign to make him look like he's foreign. You can't trust him. He's not a Christian. He's not white. He's not this. And, you know, it's, it's very telling that at the time when Barack did get the nomination, you did have a, a fair uh, amount of Hillary supporters who went over to McCain because he was, you know, oh, someone we can trust because, you know, he's like, you know, more familiar. Um, you know, like, like, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, look, it was war between Hillary and Barack. And, uh, you know, you, you not only have to be willing to kind of, you know, get down into the dirt a little bit at least. Uh, but again, I, I feel like we're either going to advance these ideas through somebody who is a magnetic figure like him or somebody who does take more of a Trumpian approach where they're playing like winner takes all type politics where, you know, Trump is as much of a, uh, uh, a novice and an illiterate moron he is when it comes to how our, you know, government actually works. And I don't think he has a full understanding of what he can actually do to either help people or benefit himself to the maximum amount that he, that he can. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, like, the kind of stuff that he's funneling into his own pocket off of Mar-a-Lago and, you know, all that shit is just like, you know, chunk change. Uh, to the type right. of way that you know, type of ways many politicians enrich themselves, uh, but you know that's like another story. Um, but you know what he is good at is wielding his fan base as a cudgel, you know, in 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 putting himself in the position that he's in, where no one in his party is willing to go against him, like at all. You know, it is is yeah, they're terrified of the repercussions that they do. They're absolutely yeah. terrified, and unfortunately, Bernie has been completely unable to leverage the influence and power of his movement against the Democratic establishment. 
um, for whatever reason. I mean, maybe it has to do with uh, fears of, you know, breaking the party apart and not being able to unite things once he does get into a position of power, maybe. But I feel like Trump has at least illustrated that going that route is possible, you know, at least on the other side. And functionally, I, I don't see a lot of uh, what the Republican Party does is, is at its at its base, you know, is just how it works as a political party as being that much different than how the Democratic Party functions. Um, I feel like, you know, philosophically and ideology that you can have people who are on the left who will look at Bernie, just like many Republicans look at Trump and see him and say, you know, I don't like this. I don't like that. He's a flawed candidate. He's an asshole. But I still see him as the option to represent what I see as my point of view. Like I have no other right. choice. I don't, I don't see Hillary as that choice. Trump right. is that choice, even if I have moral or ideological disagreements with him or if I don't like the tweets. And, you know, there are a number of Republicans, you know, white, white wine moms who, you, you know, who are hanging out on Facebook all day who you could get on camera saying, yeah, you know, I don't like the tweets. I don't like the way he acts. But, you know, I voted for him because yeah, still gonna vote I, for him. Yeah, you know, I hate Hillary. I'm a conservative. I think he represents conservative values. You know, Bernie or someone in a Bernie type of position could easily sort of wield that same power and, you know, whip moderates into the same position where they're saying, OK, you know, I think he's a little radical, but the option is fucking Trump. You know what I mean? Or yeah. somebody, you know, or Pence or somebody who wants to restrict abortion rights or the option is somebody who wants to put more kids in cages or the option is somebody who uh wants to you know implement more wars or the option is somebody who uh you know uh, wants to uh, uh do more uh, aggressive uh, policing you know in minority right. neighborhoods you know um so i mean if you, if you give people a very sharp contrast you're putting them in a position where they actually have to make a choice and while you know what you were saying earlier is true and and i think it was also kind of a bad strategy for the sanders campaign to just go all in on like this hope and a prayer that young people are just going to like fucking flood the polls so that's never worked uh, before but um you know bernie has expanded the base and has been killing it with the muslim population yeah with uh, the Latino population, um, who you can understand are going to be way more skeptical of somebody who was in an administration that did go in so deep on the war on terror, that did go in so deep on deporting more people than the Bush administration did. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, like, those groups of people are not going to look at Biden and be as excited as they would be for a Bernie. And when you have the news and pundits talking about the changing demographics of America and, you know, how the voter base is looking less white and this, that, and the other thing. It's those demographics of people that are leading kind of the charge in that, in that change. Like it's, you know, especially the uh, growing Latino vote that is right, uh, right. Sort of like changing that, uh, changing that voter base entirely. And you need that vote to come out and be excited and be, and be driven. And, and look at the end of the day, um, you know, sort of like twisting of the arm, you know, type of politics is going to be how this is achieved. Because uh, look, if, if moderates really wanted to get every single Bernie voter excited, fired up and rushing into the voting booth to uh, to support Biden, all he would have to do is just pick three of his biggest policies and be like, OK, I'm for this, you know, right, and, right. and show that he's embracing the plan, have Bernie, you know, give it a seal of approval uh, but he's not going to do that, you know, because they have no interest in sort of like, you know, giving up the money train, the same money train that the Republicans respectively, you know, ride as well. That's uh, the thing. It's like like the the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. At the end of the day, it's all money. And I think Bernie is the only candidate that's in the race that is different from the rest because you have you have establishment Democrats and then you have progressives. Right. So you have the people that um, the, the Democrats that we'll say they're for the issues but at the end of the day it comes down to the money and the power of it and then you have someone like bernie who legitimately uh wants to wants to make a change and i think that what uh, one reason bernie probably will not get the nomination is he has the entire democratic party working against him because the things bernie wants would be bad for the democratic party at the end of the day right because um the healthcare industry donates to republicans and democrats um, and so much money is there. 
Democrats don't want Bernie to win because if he revolutionizes the healthcare industry, all that money is going to be gone out of the pockets of, you know, Democrats as well. It's not just a Republican thing. So I think that um, the odds are really against him with this because he's getting in there and he's kind of shaking things up. And just like in 2016, you know, they don't want that happening. They want to stay to the status quo. And um, Ryan, the, the, my, my best friend that I do my channel with, he put, a, he put it in really good terms. He said, um, I think Bernie is needed because with something as, as radical as Trump, the, the answer that we need is we need someone to take that and, and revolutionize it in the other direction not just go back to the status quo that led us to Trump in the first place, you know? And that looks like that's probably what's going to happen is we're going to end up going back to the status quo uh, that we had before Trump. And then we risk, you know, changing nothing really, just going kind of back to how it was and eventually getting another Trump. Yeah, you know, while I, I do critique a, a sort of Bernie's campaign strategy uh, centering as much as it did around youth voters. Uh, moderates continually run an even more flawed play that has lost numerous times, and yet they still play it. And that's that we're going to offer Republicans, uh, you know, not offer the base, we're going to offer Republicans a Republican light type of candidate and presume that because this person is not that far left, you're going to jump on the train with us because, you know, we're going to tease you into it because, oh, yeah, we're not that far left. You know, we're a little Which conservative. Doesn't, doesn't happen. When you, but when you give Republicans a choice between a Republican or a Republican light, they just choose Republican. Yeah, absolutely. That's every single time. They they're they're like, never why, going to choose the centrist Democrat. Like, why would you do that? Like, if, look, if, if tomorrow the Republican Party, um, <laughs> uh, you know, put a, a, you know, put Trump to bed, and, you know, offered me like, I don't know, let, let's just throw Mitt Romney out there as sort of like a less insane, you know, my man. Pro proposition. My man, Mitt, my man, Mitt, who, I, who funnily enough today just proposed $1,000 for everybody. I saw that, <laughs> I saw that. As a result of the coronavirus thing. So Mitt, Mitt Romney's buying into the, 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 at least at least a short-term UBI, I guess. Yeah. So, uh uh, so, you know, if, if, you know, if, if they threw Mitt Romney out there and sort of like a proposition, like, come on, guys, come vote over here. I swear the you know, the craziness is all like, you know, it's it's all in the past. Everything's chill like that. That's not enticing to me. Like, how is that going to be enticing to anybody? So, yeah. um, uh, uh, you know, any, anybody who actually ideologically cares about, you know, what they think is their political worldview. Like, you're not going to be enticed by a vanilla candidate from the other side. Like, that's not sexy. That's not appealing. Uh, and, and I feel like if you asked average Democrats that, you know, would you be enticed to vote for a really moderate Republican? Most of them would probably say no. And yet they allow the DNC and pundits like on MSNBC to talk them into this logic that, oh, yeah, we'll work on our side. No, that's no, essentially no. what Joe Biden is. But <laughs> Well, yeah, that's, that's essentially what Joe Biden is. That's the bargain they're trying to run again. You know, they're thinking like, yeah, you know, for every uh, union worker that we lose, we're going to pick up a wine mom, you know, who uh, who voted for George W. Bush. And it's like, no, it's not going to fucking work that way. Like, that's not like how Americans uh, think about politics. A lot of Americans politically aren't even really all that ideological and don't understand how far onto the left or the right they are and don't fully understand a lot of the labels that they put onto themselves politically. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I mean, at a very at a, at a baseline. Uh, you know, they sort of get conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat. But beyond that, like a lot of people are just politically illiterate, illiterate which is why Bernie has sort of made it as far as he has partially because he run or has run for a long time as an independent. And when he does talk, he just kind of talks about a lot of common sense issues that are just appealing to people. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, young people aren't voting for the guy because he has like a whole lot of swag. You know, or he's like, <laughs> or he's like really sexy or appealing. Yeah, I mean, aesthetically, candidate, yeah. Aesthetically, you know, he's he's one of the he's one of the less appealing candidates. He looks like the same age group of 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 people uh, that most young people are turned off by in politics. Yeah, like, like what like he's when, saying, what he's speaking to. They're uh, back to speaks, I feel like I can like smell his breath. Like he's not the most appealing <laughs> looking candidate, or or the most uh, like you know, it's like ah, oh, he's sexy. Like Obama kind of had that sex appeal to him, you know. He was young, and it was like, "Oh, it's a handsome, it's a handsome dude," just like Justin Trudeau. 
Um, Bernie doesn't necessarily have that, uh, but it's the things he's saying, and it appeals to everyone. And I feel like the things Bernie says should fundamentally appeal to everyone, regardless if you're left or right or wherever you are on the spectrum, because I feel like everybody should be down for free health care uh, that the government provides, because we have the resources and we have the money for it. Um, the thing is, the healthcare industry wants to commit people otherwise, and they do a really good job doing that. Yeah. Um, no, they, they make people afraid because they're like, you know what you have. You know, it's like, here's the devil that you know. You know, it's like, so be afraid of any type of change. You know, any type of change to the system will be uh, be a taking away of your health care, when really it's sort of like we're getting rid of the insurance middleman between you and your health care. Is, is and really they, they do a good job of convincing people uh, – kind of harkening back to like Soviet style imagery as in like people are like, Oh, uh, if we have Bernie um, in office, you know, we're going to be, we're going to end up like Venezuela or we're going to end up like the Soviet union where there's going to be bread lines. Or if you, if you say something, you know, out of line, you're going to be put, you know, in front of the firing squad. And, and cause like my dad, for instance, believes that kind of stuff. Uh, my dad thinks that Bernie's a communist and I have discussions with him. I'm like, do you understand that these like are not communist radical ideas? Um, a lot of people want you to think that for sure, because I think that's a great way to keep someone with those ideas out of office, uh, especially when you have the generation of, of baby boomers that grew up during the Cold War. Um, so I, I think that I, I think Bernie, I think one thing that hurt him was calling himself uh, or labeling himself as a socialist uh, at certain points um, because I think it would have been better saying he's a – because these are, like, social democratic policies. Uh, like, look at Sweden or Denmark. Like, this is not, like – people, when they think of socialism, they think of uh, the Soviet Union or uh, Venezuela or something like that, you know? And I think that, yeah. I think that did a lot of damage. Yeah, I, th I think hopping onto the, uh, uh, the socialism, you know, uh, label – you know, the early on is a, as has been sort of short sighted in terms of like a marketing standpoint. I think what's, you know, much more effective is, uh, you know, making what you're proposing people to be what it is. It's normal in every other country. It's fucking normal. The only thing Bernie Sanders has been trying to do uh, over the course of his campaign is, and again, another label that I think he uses a little prematurely is like revolution and revolutionary yeah because revolution makes people think of like russia like that kind of shit like may, maybe in the sense that you know you're you're like uh uh you know so we're we're, we're ideologically and, and infrastructurally so far away from where a lot of other countries are maybe in a sense that is kind of revolutionary to bring us to that point but the only thing that bernie has been doing over the course of his campaign is literally just update the fucking iOS and just bring us to the same operating system that every other modern nation has been on for like the past 20 to 30 years. Yeah, um, we're lagging behind. And what's like, I, I think that what's going on right now with this pandemic with COVID-19 is that it is exposing how ill prepared um, our, our healthcare system is. Um, like I said earlier, my friend, uh, the doctors say that they think she has it, um, and they don't have a test for it. She can't get a test. And all these other countries, like testing, they have drive through testing. South Korea has drive through testing. Where are the fucking tests? Like, why are we so ill prepared uh, as, as supposedly one of like like the best nation on earth that is the most? Um, I watched Trump's speech the other night, where he said we have the best health care in the world. We are the most prepared in the world. No one's getting tested for coronavirus. And the numbers that they're showing right now of what America has, I guarantee it's double or triple that because how will you know if no one's getting tested right now, you know? And you also have so many people uh, currently that um, don't believe it's an issue and they think it's being overplayed or blown out of proportion. Um, and, and to the people that are saying that, I, I just like, we're in the midst of a pandemic, you know? Like, this is really serious. A lot of people will compare it to the common flu and say, like, oh, well, you know, the, the flu kills more people. True. The flu does kill uh, more people than coronavirus has. But coronavirus is new. We don't have a vaccine for it yet. Um, we don't know that much about it. Uh, and we haven't seen something like this in a while. Uh, we've had epidemics before in my lifetime. But I don't remember. I don't know. Have we had a pandemic in my lifetime? Um, we did have uh, H1N1. 
with that pandemic. Yeah. But the thing is, while the flu has historically killed more people, we understand the percentage of people who are likely to die as a result of the flu. Yeah. And, and this has a higher infection rate, too. And this has a higher infection rate from what we understand so far. And the death rate from what we understand so far is higher as well. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about like with the flu 0. 0.00, you know, and then the numbers start coming in. Whereas with, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the coronavirus, from what we understand so far, is, as far as we've been able to test, and the countries that have been doing the most testing, like South Korea, maybe have the best picture. And we're talking about like one, two, three percentage rates as far as like, you know, guarantees of death. Um, on top of that, uh, 20 to 15 percent of everybody who's catching this thing is landing in, you know, critical condition. So a lot of the people who are surviving are only surviving because they have access to a hospital, respirators, um, you know, they have access to that medical equipment. Meanwhile, and, uh, and here, you know, while over here, yeah, that's not happening. We're so over, over in Italy, um, they have some of the highest rates of death. And uh -huh. you know, for there, there's a lot of older people, there's a lot of rural areas where it could be potentially spreading to. Um, uh, you know, they're starting to make choices of like, we only have so many people we can put on these respirators, this, that, and the other thing. And I feel like over here, we're kind of close to kind of hitting that point. Um, in my home state, uh, as I just said, uh, I think I, I referenced earlier, our government, uh, uh, our governor came on national news saying like, you know, one of our hospitals is full, hundreds of nurses in quarantine. We don't have tests. We don't know who has it, who doesn't. Uh, and, you know, our, our, you know, our healthcare system over here could be at capacity at some point. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if we don't get like some actual investment in all of this right now, like we're not going to be able to deal with the rush of people who are going to hit the hospital, uh, when they realize they have this thing because the, uh, the incubation rate is so long, it's like, you know, yeah. two weeks that some people yeah. are going without knowing they have it. And, um, yeah, for like and all of a sudden they're spreading it without realizing that you have it. And all of a sudden they realize they're sick and, uh, you know, don't be surprised if, we don't start seeing a lot of people who realize they have it a few weeks from now post this weekend where everybody was in every fucking grocery store across America fighting over toilet paper. Because you don't know how many people out of those hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions of people all engaging in that who might've been sick. You know, it's like before that the CDC and, you know, medical uh, institutions were recommending like, Hey, social distancing. Hey, keep away from each other. Hey, like maybe don't go outside so much. And That's at it. the point where we're getting that recommendation, everyone's fighting it the fuck out of the grocery store. So, you know, yeah, what, do you think, what, what do you think the result of that's going to be? Because right now, like, let's say we're in another, what we are, another incubation period. When we're, I was out at the store today with a bunch of people, I'm going trying to get some supplies, everything's sold out. And I remember thinking like, how many people here right now could be spreading it without, it's in the incubation period. So, they don't know they have it. They don't have any symptoms, but this whole store could be filled with it right now. You know, it's like the the numbers in America right now are drastically higher than what the reports are showing because no one's getting tested. The reports are only going to show how many people are getting tested and confirmed. But if we're not offering tests to people, I, I was listening to uh, the radio the other day, and this guy was saying how he had come in contact with one of his clients who had tested positive. Um, so he contacted his like local health officials. He called, uh, I don't know the specifics, but he called like his hospital and stuff. And he was like, hey, uh, I came in contact with someone who tested positive for, for COVID-19. Uh, what should I like? What should I do? And they couldn't give him a straight answer. He would, kept going to voicemail. And finally, when he got through to someone, they were like, uh, well, if you're not showing symptoms, like, just don't worry about it. Like there was no test available. No, no, like you can't get a test essentially in America. Um, and I remember today, like, uh, I, Idris Elba uh, got it, and I was like, how'd he get a test? And I'm like, oh, he's in another country right now. Uh, it's like Tom Hanks. When, when Tom Hanks got tested, I was like, I remember me and Ryan were like, how'd he get a test? And like, oh, he's in Australia. Okay. And I think that one of the huge takeaways from this pandemic, uh, it's going to get a lot worse, and I think that it's going to show so much of the weakness in not only our healthcare system, but also kind of in just a lot of the structures of American society that we have right now. Because with a nation as strong as the United States, um, with so much power, with so, so much money and so many resources, there's no excuse that we shouldn't be one of the you know, best prepared countries for, for a pandemic. 
uh, there's no excuse that we shouldn't be treating our citizens uh, to, to the fullest quality and, and the quickest treatment uh, of, of a lot of countries out there. Like you were saying, you know, we should be killing it right now because we, we have the resources and really at the end of the day, it's, it's all about resource allocation. Um, look, what it would cost right now for what Bernie has proposed and even Elizabeth Warren for us to do free college for everybody uh, would only cost the amount of billions of dollars that we just increased the military budget by in 2017. Yeah. You know? And well, not to mention, mil- fucking over two trillion dollars we pumped into the Fed in the last few days to stimulate yeah. the banks. It's like I, I never want to hear the argument like, "Well, how are you going to pay for it again?" After they just pulled two point two trillion out of nowhere and threw it into the Fed for what, like a like a super small bump? Like, if that money had gone into something like that, that two point two trillion cost more. I retweeted this cost more than the International Space Station, the Apollo mission, the Interstate Highway. Uh, ending uh, world hunger for 10 years and ending poverty in the United States, all combined. So the money is there. We have the money, but, you know, it's not being allocated. Like you're saying with resource allocation, it's not being allocated, you know? So we, it, we have the money and billionaires have the money as well. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, like, look, we, we need a better tax structure to, to not only sort of be siphoning some of this from them, but also siphoning this from all those fucking offshore accounts, be siphoning this out of Wall Street, be siphoning this out of companies like Amazon that continue to go tax-free on the federal level. And, And look, here's the thing. While I don't begrudge anybody like their right or their desire to make money because there are a lot of people who reflexively uh, you know, sort of react to that kind of thing and say, well, well, why can't you, you know, just let people make the money they want? Why do you got to tell people how to spend their money or this, that, and the other thing? Why are you stealing money from people? Like, look, the system that they're making money off of is provided structurally by this country that they live in. You know, if it wasn't for the government, as much as we like try to embrace this idea in America of, of rugged individualism, you know, if, if it wasn't for the American government, if it wasn't for infrastructure that we provide, if it wasn't for uh, the internet, the DOJ fucking, you know, rolled the, you know, uh, ball on first, if it wasn't for uh, um, the money that we're fucking printing, you know, the monetary system that we built as well, like you wouldn't have that money uh, piled up to begin with. Uh, You know, it's and, and at this point, somebody like Jeff Bezos, like, look, another 10, 20, 50, even $100 billion in that man's pocket is not really going to make much of a difference to that man's life. You know, there's... Which there's crazy there's... because when you think about the scale of how big 1 billion is, even compared yeah. to 1 million, you think about how big 1 million is, the difference between 1 million and 1 billion is astronomical. So to think People of don't understand 20, 50, 100 billion dollars, that's... They don't understand what the fuck a billion is. And look, at the end of the day, Um, I'm not even averse to somebody having a billion dollars, even two, even three billion. Uh, You know, while I understand wealth inequality is a thing, like the worst thing about wealth inequality and really kind of the worst thing about billionaires is not just simply that they have money, you know, because at the end of the day, like we we have a fiat currency system uh, that that money that they have stashed away in fucking bank accounts doing absolutely nothing could easily be offset by just printing more fucking money, you know, but, but here's the thing they save up that money and then they use that money to buy politicians, to buy legislation that favors them. Yeah. They use that money as a token of power, which I mean is, is uh, exemplified by the whole Michael Bloomberg campaign. Like that yeah. man just overnight became one of the most legitimate candidates in the race to the point where on Super Tuesday, he's coming in third in states, which is like, you know, sure, he wasn't getting delegates in a lot of states and he wasn't, you know, winning a lot of the time. He won an American Samoa. You know, that says something. Yeah. Um, but but the, know, the, the fact that people are going out and voting for him based on just the fact that he's, you know, able to spend <laughs> that much money to push himself up to the top, even if he's not getting delegates, the fact that he's still getting those votes shows that, you know, money does, you know, it absolutely buys power. It does. And look, at the end of the day, all Michael Bloomberg wanted to do was fucking be a spoiler. Because if he blows $500 million now, if Bernie or Elizabeth doesn't get into the office, that means he doesn't have to pay five, six billion dollars of taxes later down the road. So he made that wager and he won, you know? He yeah, won and that's, the waters. that's another reason why a lot of Democrats don't want Bernie, uh, which the, it's the hypocrisy that upsets me is that 
what Bernie is fighting for, things that the left, you know, should want. But a lot of these Democrats, almost all of them, don't want Bernie in office because they know that if Bernie's in office, their taxes will go up. And at the end of the day, like I said, it all comes down to money. So these Democrats don't necessarily care about the policy or the issues. It's about the money. And if their taxes are going to go up under Bernie, you know, they don't want that. Ultimately. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, man. Thank you for coming on and, and, and talking. Well, about it. it was fun, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's it's rare. It's rare. Uh, I run into other content creators who are passionate about this kind of thing, and 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 not, not only that they don't care about it or do care about it, but are are willing to sort of be as open with it because I think there are a lot of content creators out there who, if, who if I do reach out to them and I do talk to them, you know, they, they understand the baseline importance of like, you know, you get that if you got cancer tomorrow, you'd have like no way to continue running your YouTube channel. Your podcast would be fucking dead. And even if you do have like some semblance of healthcare insurance now, because, you know, you're paying for it, you know, out of your own pocket, like you would lose your revenue stream to pay for that. Right. Like you, yeah, yeah. That. You, you understand the benefit of, of, you know, something like a Medicare for all system. And, you know, in that conversation privately, you know, a lot of them do get it. They understand, but no, they, yeah. From the, from the creators that I, I talk to on a regular basis, you know, like we're all on the same page and that's what's, what's baffling is like, um, all these creators, we're all on the same page. Almost all of us are on the same page with these issues. Um, I do understand the fear of, of speaking politically. Uh, I kind of eased into it and ended up just kind of doing it after a while. Uh, I was definitely scared at first. Uh, Cause you know, you get a lot of the like, stick to the funnies YouTube man, shut up about politics. And I understand, like I know a lot of people don't want to hear me talk about politics. And I know a lot of people disagree with me and I might be wrong sometimes. Uh, it, the thing is, though, I feel like currently we're at a state uh, in our nation and just our entire world where I feel like if I have the platform, uh, this kind of shit's too important to not use my platform for that. Uh, and I don't uh, I'm not mad at any content creators that don't use it for that because I understand that it comes with a lot of criticism. Um, but I, I think it is currently this stuff so important that we need to be vocal about it. Well, I, well, that, and I think it's also important to talk about it just to sort of like normalize the idea of talking about politics and talking about these issues in the way that, you know, we are, because it's not, it's not a big fucking deal to have a political conversation, you know, even with somebody who's conservative or Republican, if they're acting in good faith, you know, because at the end of the day, I, I feel like what's more dangerous to American politics and life in America than somebody who is conservative or who is right wing is, um, uh, is just money in politics in general, because as long as money in politics continues to paint the background and influence all the choices our you know legislators are making, uh, th there's no chance of an, of, uh, of an honest debate of anything. You know, there's there's no chance of an honest debate between you know big government, small government, this you know fucking program, that program. You know, the money spent here, money spent there, because ultimately everyone's interests and everyone's actions are being painted by who their donors are, who's right, right, of course, to their who's going to donate to their campaign in the next cycle. You know, nobody's actually operating from an ideological standpoint. Everyone's operating from well, this guy is going to fund my campaign next time standpoint. And, um, you know, as long as we're in that pay, as long as we're in that place, nobody's having a real right left type of debate in our government. And, you know, maybe at some point that, you know, that needs to happen. I would love to put any of these issues, uh, you know, up against, uh, you know, any issue that uh, 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 neocon or, you know, like a fucking libertarian type has to sort of throw out there, you know, that's yeah, totally. have, have that discussion and, you know, convince whoever it convinces, you know, if, if you make the best arguments, then those arguments will, you know, pan out. Uh, but again, as long as money continues to poison the well, um, you know, whether it be through campaign contributions or whether it be through the mainstream media, because look, I mean, the entire media at this point has been so consolidated, consolidated and homogenized over the past, you know, uh, fucking 20 to 30 years and is now owned by a very small group of uh, you right. know, mega media corporations. Like, of course, everything that they say and do is going to be in the name of their parent companies and is going to serve yeah. the interests of those parent companies. Because a lot of people don't realize that, the, that so much of uh, so many media organizations are owned by the same parent companies. They are. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like, you know, uh, it, it doesn't really matter whether you're watching Fox, CNN or MSNBC. 
like the moment Medicare for all turns up, the first question you're going to get is, how are you going to pay for it? 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 And like, you know, meanwhile, yeah. that question is not brought up when it comes to let's increase the mil military budget by 70 billion. Let's throw $1.5 yeah. trillion dollars into the stock market. And also, you know, as the economy is on the verge of crashing because of this whole coronavirus thing, you know, of course now, uh, you know, all of these pundits and all of these news stations that have just been like shitting on Bernie, shitting on quote unquote socialism when they're really just policies that other countries implement. They're now, you know, uh, uh, flirting with the idea of like, oh, yeah, maybe a UBI or oh, yeah, maybe like eight hundred billion dollars just injected into the economy because people aren't making money right now. And that's like, well, where's that money going to fucking come from? You know, I mean, where's all no one questions that? Yeah, from? it's like, oh, where's that money coming from? It's like mm -hmm. no one questions it. But when it's an industry that historically, you know, funds the campaigns of politicians and continues to poison the well and muddy the waters of our, you know, gears of politics, then it's like, well, you know, it's like, mm, uh, 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 how are we going to pay for that? I don't know. Um, you know, uh, it was really hilarious, uh, I think, back and forth. And this is like probably, you know, a, a, a fucking deep pull on, you know, po some political nerd shit that uh, I probably shouldn't even bring up. But it was a really funny exchange between, uh, I think, Wolf Blitzer and, and maybe it might have even been Rand Paul um, on uh, on CNN about, uh, uh, you know, some of the money that we were uh, 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 in, in weapons deals that we were doing with uh, Saudi Arabia uh, at the very beginning of the Trump administration. And uh, when Rand Paul had sort of like, you know, uh, expressed some concern over that wolf blitzer was like well what's going to happen to all those jobs if we don't sell them like all those weapons and stuff you know it's like um i don't know if it's in like the best interest of the entire world to just be like selling the saudis billions of dollars of like high-grade weaponry <laughs> yeah but the jobs anthony the jobs the jobs the weapons jobs it's exactly. like but the, thing, but the thing is at the end of the day that's just government money going to those military contractors. And that money could be invested in basically anything else that people could have the job to do. And that's really you know, kind, of, yeah. kind of another funny philosophical, uh, you know, trap that a lot of people fall into that I think we'll probably end this conversation off with this general idea of like, you know, well, we can't, you know, do any kind of government program ever because anything the government does inevitably is going to fail because the government does everything bad. You know, just look at the post office. The post office is like the cancer of human society. You know, mm -hmm. The post office is like the worst thing to happen. You know, look at the post office. When in reality, like government funding and, you know, government programs have done nothing in America other than like formulate the most deadly army that mankind has and will ever know. You know, it's like, so, I mean, if the government can basically like, uh, create the the deadliest weapons known to man can create something that can be miles up in the sky and you don't see it you don't know it's there you don't see it you don't hear it you have no clue that it's above you and in a split second with it being above you can drop a bomb on you that just obliterates you you don't even you die quicker you didn't even fucking know it was happening if a country can <laughs> if a government can't make anything quote unquote but can make that like it can formulate a healthcare system. <laughs> easily, easily. You know, like we, we, we invest billions, trillions of dollars into, you know, developing new fighter planes and jets that we end up fucking throwing onto the scrap pile because new technology is developed or something with them just didn't work right. And instead we're throwing all the money into that instead of like, I don't know, just making sure people have insulin. Yeah. It's fucking ridiculous. It, like, like you said earlier, it's all about allocation of resources and the intri the special interests that are just uh, pushing people to believe uh, where we should put those allocations of resources uh, for the wrong reasons. All right. So thanks again for coming by and having this conversation with me. Thank you for having me. And being so, so open much. to uh, being so open to do it after I saw you, uh, you know, I, I saw you on Twitter talking that talk. And then I thought, I don't know if we'll be down to talk to like talk on camera about it because oh, again, yeah, there's yeah. so many content creators who are like, I don't want to get too political though because then it'll be drama. But you know, look, I mean, as political as I've gotten online, uh, and and I have gotten fairly political online, you know, over the past, uh, uh, I mean, really since Bernie lost to Hillary, because you know that night I was like, Bernie would have fucking won, man. Like I was kind of doubtful that Bernie would win against hillary but like after i kind of saw the way that things panned out i was like you know what like maybe i should have pushed a bit harder for him when 
Uh, he was running against Hillary because now when I think about Hillary versus Trump versus Bernie versus Trump, like Bernie definitely would have had a better shot. I and, just feel uh, like there's a lot of responsibility too. You know, it's like if if, if you have a platform, you, yeah. you know. You know, and, 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 and looks, uh, since that span of time that I've been kind of talking about a lot of this stuff, um, my my YouTube numbers, my subscribers have, have only gone up, you know, no, that like my channel's only grown since then. It's not like the moment that you say like, you know, I, I think people should have health care, that like your YouTube numbers just like start dropping into the toilet. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, right. at we're the end of the day, it's like, radical. It's like at the end of the day, if you're still making good content. Country. Yeah. If you're still making good content, people want to see, and you know your your politics isn't necessarily interrupting that. You know, it's like talking politics online and trying to normalize ideas like Medicare for all is not a danger to you. It's not a danger to your career. Uh, it's not a danger to you know your your safety or your health or your well being. So you know, take 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 the dive. Don't be such a pussy. You know, say your piece, state your opinion. Couldn't say any better myself, Anthony. All right. Couldn't say any better myself. Lo love you, boy. Love you, boy. I love you too, man. It's good talking to you.